Thank you for the introduction, Matthew. Uh, good morning, everyone. Salam alaikum. Um, so the topic today, um, so as we, you know, we're, we, there's many topics which are clinical in nature here. Um, my, uh, and, but we work in a sport medicine hospital. So, um, you know, I sort of see that there's a link between the clinical side of the hospital and also what we do upstairs, which is performance. And the study of fatigue is relevant to that because fatigue is sort of, it's the opposite side of the same coin as, as performance. Um, so normally we all, we all know that fatigue is usually defined as the reduced ability to produce force. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that task failure, okay? So what that means is you can't maintain the, the target force or if the, if the target is a maximal voluntary contraction, you're unable to meet your unfatigued MVC or something along those lines. Traditionally, we, we, we would break fatigue down into two parts, the peripheral muscles, what's going on inside the muscles, and then something that's going on inside the, the central nervous system. And for quite a long time, they've been sort of treated as, as sim separate mechanisms that are having an independent contribution to the fatigue process. But are they really? What, we're, what I'm going to talk a lot about today is more the interaction, okay? The, the, the central nervous system and the, the activation of muscle is talking to each other. So what we really know now is that they're not really independent mechanisms, but they, but they interact. Okay, so this, it's quite a science-heavy talk, this one. There's going to be lots of results from studies, and there are lots of many different techniques that are used to study fatigue. So the, the direct measure of power or force is how we actually define whether fatigue has occurred. But then if we want to explain um, the contribution or the mechanism that underlines that, there's a number of measurements. So we can do muscle biopsies or um, you know, nuclear magnetic resonance, and that's, we would, we're looking for changes in the metabolites that contribute to fatigue. Uh, we can measure oxygen uptake kinetics. That's an indirect way of looking at um, fatigue processes. And probably one of the gold uh, standard techniques for assessing whether or not a central or peripheral fatigue has occurred is to use objectives, so to use neural stimulation techniques. So in that way, what, what would happen here, for example, is you would do an MVC and then this is the maximum voluntary force. And then if you, you know, zap the nerve after that, you then sort of give a super maximal um, signal. And then, so this, this superimposed burst here would indicate the lack of the central nervous system to drive the muscle. Then afterwards, this is when the muscle is relaxing. If we look for changes in this resting twitch force, which is just a, a given stimulus, we can, we can look at changes in peripheral fatigue there. We can also use a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation where we give a, a zap to the brain to try to um, turn on the muscle. All right, so to take a step back now, um, to really understand, and I'm going to talk mainly about high intensity fatigue, the type of fatigue that occurs in high intensity exercise. All right, we know that most events, most sporting events tend to be won and lost during high intensity activities, okay? They're not won and lost when you're sort of walking or at below threshold intensity. The best way to, to really understand whether or not where the threshold is, is we look at uh, VO2 kinetics. So in, in these slides, is, these are basically all these studies are showing the same thing. And what we're looking at here is there's been an estimation of a threshold power, and we'll, we'll call that critical power for this purposes of this talk. And then, and then they do two constant load trials, one either at or just below critical power, and another one just above critical power. So very small changes in the constant load power output. And they just do that to until the subject can't continue any longer. So in each case here, on the top, we see the VO2 response at or below threshold, we're maintaining a VO2 steady state. And just above, and we're only talking small changes, maybe only 15 or 20 watts difference, we then see we move into this non-steady state. So the VO2 is gradually increasing, gradually increasing, and that's massively shortening the time that the, uh, the participants can maintain that task. Okay, so again, high intensity. So when we're looking, so, so really what's happening is that the, the mechanisms of peripheral fatigue 
are taking off above threshold. That's the importance of threshold. Okay, below threshold, there's minimal peripheral fatigue occurring. It is occurring, but not so much. But really, we're talking about high intensity exercise above threshold, and that refers to any, any sort of task in this range here, about one to 20 minutes. Okay, once we go longer than that, it's, we, we start getting down to around about threshold in that sort of 30 to 40 minute range. So some of this stuff is, you know, a lot of us that have studied exercise physiology, we, we would have read or we know about these things. There's no change here. We know that a buildup of inorganic phosphate ions, um, protons, um, increases in ADP uh, and increases in calcium, changes to membrane ironing balance, all of these occurring inside the muscle intracellularly and they're contributing to a reduction in force output. Okay. What's, it, what's interesting to know though is that these long before, even before a person reaches task failure where they cannot maintain the power anymore, the fatigue of these skeletal muscles, it can actually be overcome. We can maintain the force output by increasing our VO2. So the muscles' fibres, as they become fatigued, they actually become a little bit less efficient. Okay, so we can either increase the VO2 to maintain force or we can recruit additional muscle fibres. Both of those will tend to increase the VO2 and of course that's only, that can only keep going until we hit VO2 max. So, so what's sort of t an important take out message here is that fatigue is progressive. It's not an all or none phenomenon. Okay. Now let's sort of skip to um, what happens at task failure. So okay, so we've gone along that progression. When we get to the end point where the individual is unable to maintain the, the target power output that they've been demanded. So he, these, in these studies, that we're looking at muscle biopsies. So what actually would happen here is the subject would be cycling along and then as soon as they, they stop or they give up, okay, they put their leg up on the, on the chair, there's been an incision has been made ahead of time, the doctor goes in and snips a little bit of muscle out, they'll go and freeze that very quickly and take it away to be analysed for intracellular metabolites later on. And this is, this is something that's been, you know, it's a very, very recent study. This is ahead of print, actually. Um, and one of the things that we see here, it's quite remarkable, even though these are different times to task failure and different exercise intensity, the conditions, the metabolic conditions at task failure are remarkably the same, okay? This, I mean, the pH here, I, I think that's, that's incredible how similar the pH is at, uh, at task failure. We see the same thing in the decrease in phosphocreatine, increase in uh, muscle lactate, which is probably more relevant than blood lactate. Um, so remarkably similar metabolic conditions, despite changes in intensity and, dura and short changes in duration. Okay, here's another study from the same group, looking at more or less the same thing. They take a muscle biopsy at the moment of task failure, but now we're looking at the difference in pacing strategy. So in this, in, in the black one here, we've got an all out effort where they do a sprint effort and then just sort of hang on. And the other one is a const effort to time to exhaustion. And the power output, we can see the time is roughly the same here. So again, so what's happening here, the total amount of work in both conditions, despite the difference in pacing, it's the same. But then again, we see the same thing. We see these very, very similar metabolic conditions inside the muscle at the end of the, um, at the, end of the process. And we also see in both conditions, we're achieving VO2 max. Okay, um, same thing again. Okay, so these are, these are two different studies here. Um, in these, these bottom ones, we're seeing the same thing as the previous slides, but we're using in vivo nucleomatic resonance to, to look at the intracellular metabolism. So again, very similar phosphocreatine at, far, at task failure. Same, we reach ox, maximal oxygen uptake, okay. This one here now is a nerve stimulation technique, okay. So we're looking at the change in that potentiated twitch force from pre to post. And again, within this range of sort of around about 2 to 20 minutes, it's just the same. They, they, they can't seem to fatigue the muscle more in this, in this range, okay. Now the one thing that we do see that's a little bit different, it doesn't sort of stay the same here, is voluntary muscle activation. So note at the end, everyone's giving, everybody's giving a maximum effort, 
but they can't, as, as the duration goes a bit longer, they can't seem to activate the muscle as much as they can in these shorter tasks. We'll get on to that later. Okay, some more studies looking at nerve stimulation techniques. In this study here, what they did is they're, they're looking at the effect of pre-fatigue. So they do some kind of uh, pre-fatiguing task and then they get the person to do a five kilometre time trial. So when they, when they gradually, here's the control, here's sort of a bit of pre-fatigue and here's a lot of pre-fatigue. Okay, so we see the power outputs decreasing during that, that 5k time trial. Okay, it takes them longer to complete it, but at the end, the peripheral, the change in fatigue, okay, so the peripheral fatigue is the same, even though the power is different. Uh, this study here is using a different technique. So instead of using a, uh, a, like a time trial or sort of self-paced exercise or something like that to do the pre-fatigue, they, they give the muscle, they use neuromuscular electrical stimulation to pre-fatigue the muscle. So it's sort of involuntary muscle contraction. And again, we see the same thing. Even though there's, there's control condition here and the pre-fatigued condition, okay, after they go and do the, the, the effort, and this is a different type of activity as well. It's 10 by 10 sprint, uh, maximum sprint activity. So this one was cycling time trial. Even in a different type of activity, okay, they're still unable to fatigue the muscle more, okay, or less. It's still the same. So all of that has sort of led to this hypothesis that peripheral fatigue is a regulated process, that something is going on which is regulating the, uh, the central nervous system, is regulating the ability to recruit muscle so that we prevent some kind of catastrophic muscle damage from occurring. What I will say right now at this point, so a lot of people know about the, the, the central governor theory and we understand there's controversy in the central governor theory. This hypothesis is different. The central governor theory is more along the lines of a feed forward regulatory mechanism. But this is clearly what, what we're talking about here is the regulation by group three, four <laughs> muscle afferents, okay? And that's a feedback mechanism, okay? So we're giving, we're giving feedback from the muscle. This is nervous feedback, afferent feedback to the central nervous system. And this is inhibitory in, in nature. So when we activate these afferents, we, they are inhibitory to various regions in the central nervous system. And that will tend to inhibit, okay? It doesn't fully block, but it will inhibit descending motor drive, which is the voluntary motor drive we're sending to the muscle. What's interesting is that these afferents are activated by metabolic changes that are occurring in the muscle that we've just talked about, okay? So changes in, in muscle hydrogen ion concentration, even in the lactate anion itself. So normally we, we think that lactate is not involved actually directly in the fatigue process, but here it may be, it is activating these, uh, these afferents. Okay, so and uh, one of the ways that uh, we study the effect or the influence of those afferent, of that afferent feedback is to actually block it using pharmacologic blockade. So we use uh, there's a, a drug called fentanyl, um, and that's an opioid receptor blockade. So when we give people that drug and then say, all right, off you go, five kilometre time trial. No, this is self-paced exercise. So what happens is they go out, they can't really feel, they've lost some of the sensation from their muscles now, so they can't feel this perception of fatigue growing in their muscles, so they go out a lot harder, okay, than what they would normally. And then they just fatigue towards the end, and in the end, the the duration of the, uh, of the performance is around about the same. But interestingly, they are now able to generate a greater level of peripheral fatigue. So without that recept, without these afferent feedback anymore, they can generate more peripheral fatigue. So that's, that's evidence that's saying that these are actually having an effect. It's sort of restraining the ability to recruit the muscle and, um, and have an effect. This is a very recent study. So what in the previous studies, and then that's actually a series of studies, what they haven't done is they haven't also correlated that to the intracellular changes that are occurring by using muscle biopsy. So this, this is the, I think this is the only study now that has used both afferent feedback receptor blockade 
and also done muscle biopsies as well. Okay, so we sort of see the same thing here. They, with the blockade, they're able to achieve more peripheral fatigue, and that that sort of is sustained during the recovery process here. So this is peripheral fatigue. Um, and in the muscle biopsies, so after at the at the end, well, what they've done here is they've looked at the change from the control condition to the fentanyl condition. Okay, so because we know that they get each individual is getting more peripheral fatigue in the fentanyl condition, and that ha was shown to be correlated to the change in these key, so inorganic phosphate and and hydrogen ions, two of the key intracellular. Um, metabolites that are contributing to fatigue and so that's pretty convincing evidence that there's a link between the intracellular f processes and the, uh, the afferent feedback, the central regulation. Okay, so it's tempting to, to, to um, hypothesise that, that peripheral fatigue is uh, regulated to a certain, a critical threshold level. However, we can change that. We're actually able to, even without pharmacologic blockade, we can change the amount of peripheral fatigue that occurs at task failure by doing various things. One of those things is to change the amount of muscle mass that's involved. So in both of these studies, they're very similar studies, and the, the axis on this, on this right-hand side here is just sort of flipped upside down, but they're basically showing the same thing. When we have a larger muscle mass involved, Okay, the level, so this is, this is a negative scale, but it's um, the amount of peripheral fatigue occurring when the muscle mass is larger is not as high. So when we do small muscle mass exercise to the point of task failure, we're able to generate a higher level of peripheral fatigue. So same thing here, cycling versus single leg and double versus single leg extension there. Okay, using um, on the same sort of idea, looking is, is, you know, is peripheral fatigue always regulated to a particular threshold value. So now what we're doing is we're doing, again, it's different, uh, effects of different intensity. Um, actually, so this one, well, it, it's self-paced exercise. So this is, we're looking at the effect of different time trial durations or lengths. Okay, so we've got a four, a 20 and a 40 kilometre time trial. These are self-paced time trials, so, and they're well-trained subjects. So, of course, what people will do is they'll self-pace to a higher intensity in the shorter time trial. Just for reference, so we, we know where... So this one here, this is the only one which is really in that kind of high-intensity zone, one or two minutes up to about 20 minutes. So now we're sort of... We're in a bit of a grey area here. We're probably around about threshold here. And 66 minutes for, you know, a lot of people, unless you're a pro, really professional cyclist, we would... We would that would be a little bit below threshold intensity. OK. Um, and again, so what we see is, this is interesting, we see now that as the duration of this task goes on, the level of peripheral fatigue that the person is experiencing at the end of the time trial is a little bit less significantly so than the shorter duration. And conversely, so these indices here, now this one here, um, th they're using TMS, so they're actually zapping the brain to get a more objective um, measurement of central fatigue. And we see this converse situation occurring. It's a reciprocal. If peripheral fatigue goes down or central fatigue goes up, then the opposite occurs. Okay. Same thing again. So same group, very recent study. Um, this time what they did is they chose to base the intensity off prior, they defined the threshold value ahead of time. Okay. So what we've got here is we've got um, a task which is around about threshold, okay, and then a task which is just a little bit above threshold, and these are the time to exhaustion durations in minutes, and one which is a long way above threshold, okay. So we're seeing the same thing. As the task goes on longer, there are, they, they generate less peripheral fatigue, and that seems to be associated with a greater level of central fatigue, okay. So one of the sort of the... the you know, take home messages that we can we can take from these studies is that if we sort of if we start to overlay the, the, the fatigue and the afferent feedback, it's not just coming from the muscles alone. We also have afferent feedback coming from the respiratory system, from cardiovascular system, from heat receptors in um, and and the very various other places. 
So if we start overlaying this additional cardiorespiratory or thermoregulatory challenge, then we, we may be causing greater levels of central uh, inhibition to that descending motor drive, which makes it difficult to activate the muscle and generate the same level of peripheral fatigue. Okay, so this is, this is actually a review paper here. They've looked at a lot, a lot of different studies that have done this. And you know, I won't go through all of these, but in general, when we look at these, when we, we see the same thing, when we look within a particular type of task, we see fairly similar levels of peripheral fatigue being achieved. And then we, when we change the task to something different, like an isometric contraction or single group, or then we, when we, we start to see different levels occurring. Okay, up until now, I've been talking mostly about, um, you know, the conditions. So, you know, we, we can see the conditions. There's these changes in intracellular metabolites, and there's this regulation occurring of the, of the afferent feedback. But that actually doesn't answer the question of what is the dominant mechanism which is limiting force um, or power output, okay, or performance. And so what these guys did in, um, in a pretty interesting study is they used, they did, okay, so they do the baseline, they establish somebody's maximum 10 second sprint power. They do an increase, they do a ramp test until exhaustion. And then as soon as the person finishes the ramp test, they inflate some, uh, some cuffs some, to occlude the blood flow. And what that does is we can see here by occluding the blood flow. So this is done, and here's, they do two biopsies immediately post and another one one minute post okay um, I think they might have even done them on different days okay two tasks so they're not doing two biopsies sort of in a row there but what they found is we can see that there's not not much of a recovery in fact we can see the intramuscular lactates even even getting worse still PCR these are normally phosphocreatine recovers very rapidly um, after cessation of exercise but we don't see the, the recovery occurring here. Same thing with pH. However, the, re the power is recovering, okay, and these markers of metabolic fatigue are not recovering. They're similar or they're actually getting worse. So what these authors concluded was that it's, it's actually, um, it's more to do with the central regulation than the peripheral. So these here, even though they can cause reduction in force within a muscle or within an isolated muscle preparation, they're not limiting the force in a whole body um, in vivo environment, okay? So they kind of, by default or um, by exclusion, they conclude that the dominant effect is the actual, the central regulation. So with all of this work that sort of had, this more recent work, it's showing that, that this, you know, there is regulation of the fatigue, but it's task uh, specific. Uh, the same guy, so Aman was the one that came up with this, and, and Dempsey sort of came up with the, uh, the idea that fatigue is regulated. They've since sort of expanded that out to be a little bit more, to include not just muscle feedback, but rather this more kind of integrative approach where we have feedback from various organs in the body, the muscle, et cetera, et cetera, and that's feeding back into the brain. It's also, it's doing two things. It's giving sensory information, and it's also giving, it's also blocking um, the ability to drive the muscles. Okay, so let's now move on to the effect of hypoxia. So how does, how does hypoxia affect all of this stuff and how can we sort of use the knowledge of what hypoxia does to influence what we would do in practice here? Okay, so, so just quickly, hypoxia, it's very, very simple. What it does is, you know, it's it, it decreases the driving pressure of oxygen from the atmosphere all the way down to the muscle. So we, we basically, we just get less oxygen being delivered at the muscle. Okay, I'm going to return now again to the concept of threshold because that's important to understand the concept of threshold. We understand that above threshold, when we do exercise above threshold, peripheral fatigue progresses rapidly. That seems to be linked to afferent feedback, and that's regulating our ability to produce uh, muscle activation, and that limits force production. Okay, we can, we can run a very, very simple mathematical description of that. If we know what the threshold power is, okay, and we also know how much energy somebody can expend above threshold, okay, we can, we can basically use this very simple mathematical equation 
to, to estimate how long someone can, can exercise at any given power above threshold. Okay? So we can easily see here if the power is a lot higher, okay, then this will be a large number for a given amount of this, the time is shorter. Okay? So the higher the power, the shorter the time to fatigue or to task failure. Okay? What's been shown many times that the amount of energy, depending, it doesn't matter how, how, um, how long you go for within this range, two to 20 minutes, it's about the same. We, we can expend about the same amount of energy above threshold before we fatigue or reach task failure. Very recent, one of the only studies that has looked at the relationship of this, this parameter which we call W prime, okay, and this, uh, we're linking this to peripheral fatigue here. So a little bit of an underpowered study, I know, um, but even with that lack of subject participants there, not, not a high end, they still got a, a positive correlation there. Okay, so if you can expend more energy above threshold, you can tend to generate a greater level of peripheral fatigue. So we really think that this value here in the mathematical description is linked to the development of fatigue. So a study, one of the studies that I did before I came to, to uh, Doha, I looked at the effect of hypoxia on these two parameters. So on the W prime parameter, which tends to be linked with fatigue mechanisms and threshold power. Okay, so clearly what happens in hypoxia is that the, the threshold power is shifted downwards. Okay, and what's even interesting there is that, the, that that's the line of identity and the slope there is almost identical to the line of identity. Okay, so it's not even, there's not even a, a, um, a bias occurring there. That seems to be correlated to the decrease in VO2 max. Okay, so people are having a similar decrease in VO2 max and critical power. Okay, so we can ascribe that to um, changes in oxygen. However, the ability to, to withstand or to generate power above threshold is remaining the same. Okay, so this hypoxia doesn't seem to be having a big effect on the mechanisms of fatigue per se, it's just shifting the baseline downwards. Okay, so in these studies where they looked at the effect of hypoxia on the objective measures of fatigue, that's what, what, we, what, what they found is, okay, this is actually hyperoxia, which is kind of the opposite, normoxia and hypoxia. So we've got a constant workout, sorry, constant workload, but in hypoxia, the time to exhaustion decreases, right? Same thing in this study here, exactly the same thing. So they've gone, so the, the, the power output's the same, but in hypoxia, vastly reduced time to exhaustion. If we shift the threshold power down, that's exactly what is happened by, that's predicted by the, the critical power two parameter model, okay? So because what's happening here is we're decreasing this value here now. So we would have predicted this decline in time to exhaustion in these, um, however, in both cases here, we see the same thing. There's no, no significant difference in the level of peripheral fatigue achievable. So that's important. What that means is that we can achieve the same amount of peripheral fatigue in hypoxia at a lower power output. Now that's quite important. That should start ringing some bells and thinking, giving people ideas, working in, in the field of rehabilitation and return to play. Just a quick slide on why this is important, okay? So having these big changes inside the muscle in some of these intracellular metabolites, this is, it's sort of important. We actually, we need these changes because these changes, some of these changes, are linked to um, signaling pathways which lead to adaptations which improve performance, okay? So if we don't keep stimulating those things, it's, it's a use it or lose it. If we don't stimulate that, we have, we have decreases in some of these activation pathways and we may find that we have decreases in aerobic performance occurring, okay? So we really want to do this. We want to stress the muscle to stimulate the muscle. Um, Okay, but it's not practical to measure critical power at many, many different altitudes. So a probably a, a more practical or an applied way is if we just know it at one altitude, okay? If we just do the test once, and we might do that at sea level, which would be most practical for people that don't have access to altitude rooms, of course, 
um, then what we would do is we would use a prediction equation to estimate by how much that threshold power has decreased at a given altitude. And we did that. That's what we actually did here at Aspatar. Um, we, did, we tested at all of these at, at sort of uh, close to sea level and these four different altitudes. And we found this relationship. Here's the individual data and here's the sort of the mean data. This is actually um, not the mean data. This is a third order polynomial which predicts the change in threshold power as we increase to altitude. Okay. So when we come to, we can actually use that information now as well, even during, there's another model, which is a model of, um, what this model is, it's a model of depletion and recovery of this W prime parameter, okay? Because a lot of the contemporary information is linking W prime, okay, to fatigue or the, the progression of fatigue, it's a little bit like, saying what we're trying to do is we're trying to use a mathematical equation to describe the progression and recovery of fatigue say during high intensity intermittent tasks like we've got here. So here what we've got, this value P4, what this is, this is that just means it's, it's, it's the, um, the power output that an individual could sustain for about four minutes. Okay, because they're doing it in hypoxia and in normoxia, okay, that the absolute power is different. So the relative power is, is the same when we say relative to threshold power, it's the same, but the absolute power is lower in hypoxia. Okay, ignore this one here. We'll just focus on these two. Um, this is the this is the model. We're using this mathematical equation to model how much of this is left. So if what we see is during the interval it goes down, and during the recovery period it increases. So we're sort of we're fatiguing and recovering. But what's happening as long as we know the critical power in hypoxia, it's almost identical. We see the same sort of progression here. The only difference is they don't go quite as long because you can't, it, it's sort of the recovery. You can only recover at, at um, you know, at, at most at passive at rest. We can't sort of recover lower than rest. Okay, so the proximity to task failure is sort of fairly similar in hypoxia and normoxia. So how we would apply that, so we can apply this model now to basically any, it doesn't have to be some set workout, it can be, can be any random workout that we choose, okay, we, here's the, you know, here's the fatigue process, so at this point here and here in this workout, this, we would expect this individual to be reaching almost the point of task failure or fatigue, okay. Um, if we apply that now, let's just say we've got an uninjured athlete, he has a threshold power of 300 and he's able to expend 20 kilojoules above threshold power before he reaches task failure. What we want is we want this, this is what we want to achieve. We want to get them near to the point of fatigue because we know that that stimulates adaptations. If we take that same player, they come in and they're injured and let's just say Rod says, look, this guy's got a spondylo something or other. I don't want him to exercise more than 250 watts, okay? Maximum, 250 watts. Okay, if we do, if we, okay, so let's do some one minute intervals with this guy, he's going to get nowhere near the point of fatigue. This player is going to get detrained, for sure. Okay, what we can do though is we can use the model and the understanding of this relationship between hypoxia and threshold power to artificially reduce the threshold power now. So if we we throw him, and, and we would also use, we would play around to, with work to rest ratios. So here we are again, we've got his maximum power allowed at 250 watts, but now what I've done is I've sort of artificially reduced his, his threshold power through the use of the hypoxia, okay? And now we, what we're doing here is we're sort of getting down into that range where we're, we're stimulating, you know, we're getting to the point where we expect to see these big changes occurring in the muscle and hopefully maintaining these stimulation of adaptive responses. So that's, uh, that's it for today. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope um, that gave some, some good ideas there.